Uh, Rami, you have a question about meditation and breathing? Yeah, so I understand that the idea is that breathing is just natural without any, any focus of doing anything with the breathing. Um, but sometimes I guess it seems like I've been wanting to breathe a little deeper just to kind of maintain a little focus because I'm starting to get distracted or sleepy or maybe a little bit of pain from sitting there. So I try to do some like deeper, a little more focused breath during the meditation, which seems kind of like natural in a way because it seems like it's just what I need in the moment, but I don't try and maintain it for the whole time. Um, any perspective on that? Yeah. When when you when when you're busy with the meditation channel challenge, the point is that you learn to let your breath find its own way. So every time when you correct it, you tell your body, "I don't trust you." Right. That's basically the idea behind it. So uh, your body goes through a particular kind of program because of its natural states. And at the moment when you meditate, you hold your attention to the dantian. Your breath will go in all directions, but eventually it will end up in the dantian. Right. So the reason why we let the breath go free is because it has to end up in the dantian, and then the dantian has to take over and cause the breathing instead of that you're breathing. Right. But if you feel like you know your breathing is not going deep enough, you artificially force it to go deep, and at that moment you say to your body like, okay, natural is not good, artificial is good. Right. So you have to understand the interaction with your body is always like a little bit like a language. Are you partnering with your body or are you controlling your body? This is basically it. The Western ID is usually that you're controlling your body. So every time when something doesn't go like you want, you panic and you do something to try to uh, avoid the problem. But by avoiding that problem, you also avoid getting better. Yes. So at the moment when you're sitting in Dantian meditation, you're sitting, you're sitting, you're sitting, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, and your breath sometimes goes high, sometimes go to the left, right, back, front, uh, goes to all kinds of places. Your diaphragm feels stiffened and stuff like this. And but at a certain point, you start noticing like, hey, my breath has changed. My musculature in my belly is changing. The way how the breath is being taken is changing and so forth and so forth. There are a whole bunch of diseases of the lungs which are related to the absence of the relationship uh, between the kidneys and the, and the lungs. And either the cause is in the lungs or is in the kidneys. So the whole point of the 100-day meditation is to help this, to help restore or create this kind of relationship by allowing, uh, well, I don't really like to use the word, but by trying to heal the kidneys or the lungs in the way how they relate to each other. So you're basically rebuilding trust between these two organs. And you have to also trust on the fact that your body can actually restore that trust without your help. Yes. So in itself, when these kind of things happen, yes, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Maybe sometimes even it leads to crying. Yeah, maybe it leads to another emotional state, grief or anger or something like this. This can all happen during meditation. Meditation can go through all kinds of states of uh, mind. But in the end, uh, the meditation has to gradually sink into the Dantian. And that is the moment when you actually start getting nervous in your body, when you get close to that. And at the moment when you arrive in the Dantian, by itself, then at that moment you start producing yang, and that yang then has to go circulate, right? So the small heavenly circulation is because of the creation of yang. If you do it artificially, you can create a circulation of all kinds of stuff, but it is not the stuff that we're looking for, right? That is also why people talk about energy, because they feel something's moving there, but it's not the right stuff. At the moment when the yang comes up, it is really, you can really feel like this is the yang, and your whole uh, awareness, your state of awareness is actually gradually, gradually changing. And when you go really deep in meditation, it actually can become quite trippy at a certain point. And um, there's going to be a follow up course eventually for instructors to help people through these uh, stages. And that's first the first course, which has to do with, you know, what happens physiologically. In the, in the instructor course, and the second part is uh, what kind of mental stage actually people go through and what can you do as exercise uh, when you help people to learn to meditate uh, so that they get, you know, a little bit of a preview of the state they are going to go through when they meditate. Yes, because there's a lot of things you can, you can basically... Uh, <clears throat> 
try to experience in advance so that when it happens to you, you know what that is happening to you, what why, why it's happening. You know? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, one, one thing. Yeah. About what, you know, when you just explained this, you uh, at the beginning you started something saying like you're you're meditating, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. Um, the waiting. So that's like your perception of like when you're meditating is you're just sitting there waiting. You're concentrating on your done ten. You're concentrating on uh, the form of your body and so forth and so forth. You do all these things that you have to do, and the rest is just a matter of waiting. waiting it's like uh, it's like waiting waiting for the grass to grow. You know, this is meditation. Meditation yeah. is watching the grass and waiting until it grows. So this is gradually cultivating the done ten and gradually making it sprout and create the young chi. Right. When the young man comes, the young has to circulate, it has to condensate, it has to purify by tickling back into the Dantian. And so that, that's the process. The 100 day meditation is supposed to kickstart that process. But you, but you're, but you're, okay. but as, as a natural like, process, of course, right? Happen. Yeah, you're just yeah, waiting, yeah, you're waiting, waiting, for you're waiting for that to happen. Yeah, for that to happen, okay. Yeah. And if you if you interrupt yourself frequently, like for instance, you do a week meditation and a week not or two weeks not or something like this, it can take five, six, seven years before you get to that point. If you do it 100 days in a row, you don't interrupt yourself. Usually, it should be okay. It should be happen. You should even be able to sit into the uh, lotus position if you are not having any particular handicaps that you first have to overcome. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, is that the whole question? No. No more parts for this question. <coughs> one. What, yeah, one additional. One additional. Interesting is. Yeah. One additional explanation, maybe, for that. Uh, in Taoism, when you learn to meditate, you first have to get back to your natural state. Right. That's called finding the origin, finding the origin. And at the moment when you come to the natural state, when you have achieved that, that is the root of basically your spiritual self or whatever, if you want to call it like that. And then from there, you gradually start building through all kinds of other practices uh, onto something that you're going to construct, right? So that's return to the natural state. That's just the first step. That moment you start developing a, a, a basic framework for your body uh, through which all kinds of other practices will work much better. So it's not like, okay, you have done this 100-day medita meditation, you don't have to meditate anymore. It is good to keep on meditating your whole life. But even if you only meditate for one hour a day, uh, the rest of your life, then all the other practices will go much better and they will develop more fast. So you can say basically it's like a sort of a Red Bull for a Qigong and Tai Chi Chen or something like this, right? Cocaine, something like that. Oh, yeah. cool. yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's speeding up all kind of processes. Processes that will also happen if you do not do these kind of practices, but it can take 20 years or so before anything happens. And then maybe you already you lost your attention. What? But, but here, we're only doing, here we're only doing like a half an hour a day. Well, including the preparation and the closing and stuff like this, you're busy for an hour. Almost an hour, yeah. Yeah, all the sessions in the, in the group, they are about 45 to 55 minutes, so that's about an hour. Yeah, but after the after the 100 days, then it's, then it's recommended to just keep doing it for another... Hundred thousand days, right? Just keep doing it forever. Yeah, that's the that <laughs> be our recommendation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be a recommendation. But then you, you don't have to do it as regular. So you can sometimes say like, okay, uh, I have a busy day today. I skip it. But if you skip it for years, the effect will become less. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, standing in the white stance, you know, in the Tsumuchikum, if you do it for a period of uh, two to five years every day for two hours, great, you have great achievements, right? But after this time, if you never do it anymore, then you're challenged after five or ten years to do it for, say, an hour, and you can't, because then the body has unlearned the trick already, right? So then at that moment, the benefits of developing that kind of strength or coherence is already gone. 
Yeah, so then you have to take it from other things. If you haven't learned the other things, then you know you have to go back to the beginning and do Dantian meditation, stand in a wide stance, and so forth and so forth. Yeah, but we still have the constant challenge, you know, unless we're living in a monastery or whatever, we're just devoting all day to these practices. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, today, today, uh, no, yesterday, uh, on Netflix, I found uh, a television series, I think it's American or something, about Marco Polo, and they have a preview movie from about half hour, 45 minutes, and it's about uh, how Jeji Khan uh, gets his name. And he gets that from a uh, Taoist called uh, Chul Tzu. And Chu Zhu is the founder of Longman Taoism, Longman Taoism, a branch of uh, Chuangzi Taoism, monastic Taoism. And he he was caught in the Wudang Mountains by uh, Mongol uh, warriors after he killed 25 of them or something. And he was brought to the court of Kublai Khan, and then he was basically forced to stay there as a as a prisoner and a teacher for for the son of the Kublai Khan, Zhenzhi uh, Khan. And um, from there, uh, he developed all kinds of things. And at some point, he starts teaching this uh, son. And then if you look further into the series of Marco Polo, he gets a few opportunities to say some things. Uh, for instance, he says one thing about Kung Fu at a certain point, right? Kung Fu means that you develop special abilities because of basically getting good at something. And for being good at something requires you to do hard work. So Kung Fu is the result of hard work. If you don't, if you don't concentrate and work very hard, then uh, it will not really uh, work. I think uh, Rami just uh, left uh, the building uh, because of uh, sitting in the bus. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So the answer by this is a sort of questions. You will look at it later, but that's basically what it is. So I can advise to uh, go watch this also for you, uh, Marina, if you have, or anybody else, if you have uh, Netflix, try to see if it is still there or try to score it somewhere else, because there's some, some things about this Taoist uh, thing in there, which are actually really very uh, interesting because it, fits very nicely with what we do. And if we ever get to travel to Beijing again, we go to the temple of uh, Bai Guan. There is one one temple building specifically for this Taoist, Chu uh, Zhu, uh, because the myth is that he was a teacher for Zhenzhi Khan. And because of his teaching, uh, he got Zhenzhi Khan so far as not to destroy all the Chinese culture uh, in his anger about all kinds of stuff, but to be compassionate and to maintain the legacy of uh, Chinese culture and have the Mongolians uh, absorb this uh, this legacy in their culture. So uh, that's it. So worth the trouble. So I hope we can do that uh, one time uh, to go to Budan, uh, to Dubai, one to see this uh, temple. And I will probably do a video one time about this guy. I should actually. Yes. No other questions? Well, I lost. <laughs> the signal is falling, falling away. Could you then please repeat the name of the movie that you were referring to? Because oh, Marco, Marco, well. Marco Polo. It's just a program about Marco Polo on Netflix. I don't know what's the rest of the name. Okay. I don't have Netflix, but. Okay, maybe you can maybe get it another way or something. Okay. Thanks. You can probably order it somewhere online or okay, something. Put the video out. That was Diane Marco Polo, by the way. <laughs> I was trying to put it on, see the name of the title, but. I don't, I, I automatically went to the episode. Let me see. Yeah, just called Marco Polo, that's it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I thought it was a subtitle, but apparently not. Yes? No other questions? No, thank you. Then I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you very much.